So there are two things that really matter, two macro things, and then there are some other. The two macro are what I call um, evidence of greatness and motivation. I go through every single experience you had in personal or professional life, and I want evidence of greatness because my assumption is you don't become, let's say you're 30, 30 years old, you don't become great for the first time in your life at day sleep. Somewhere you must have been great. Doesn't matter if it was about fixing the dishwasher, if it was being a tennis player or figuring something out, but I need to find some evidence that you have a spark. Hi listeners, welcome back to another episode of our interview series called It's the People. Because at the end of the day, when you strip away all the products and the software and the companies, it's really about the people. On It's the People, we get a chance to interview great founders and investors and capital allocators, and we really hope that their stories push you to be even better at what you do. This week, we had the fortune of interviewing Matteo, who is the CEO and co-founder of Eight Sleep. Eight build software and products that help you get more out of your sleep and your rest. During the discussion, we covered a range of topics that included Mateo's philosophy on why waiting makes no sense and how you have to make that change now. He shared his thoughts on what he looks for in talent when recruiting people to the team. Throughout the interview, you'll hear the through line on his obsession with efficiency, both in his personal life and in work, and many, many more things. As is uh, typical for our interviews, Matteo opens up with his life story in 60 seconds. I really hope you enjoy this one. We'll give you 90 seconds to tell us the Matteo life story. Born and raised in Italy. I used to be an athlete when I was a teenager. I did a lot of different sports, um, um, ski races, but mainly tennis. And then I raced with cars at the European level and 12 hours of Abu Dhabi. Uh, I used to be a boring business lawyer in two of the largest law firms in the world, um, Allen Overy and Freshfield Rukas Deringer. Then I started two companies in solar and tech that um, uh, were acquired, um, sold all their assets um, after a few years. And then I started Sleep 10 years ago, uh, which by now has raised $160 million from a lot of great investors, including you guys. And... Uh, it's selling in uh, in the US, Canada, UK, Australia, and Europe, a, a mattress cover that improves your sleep. Love it. If we could go back to the early, early years growing up in Italy, I'm curious if there's any memories, any experiences that really stand out that you think defined the person who you've become. It all goes back to sport. So when I was a kid, uh, my dad was racing with cars. My dad was a lawyer, but as a passion, he was racing with cars. And so I was traveling all around Italy to go and, and see his races. Uh, and so I always saw this attention for details, this obsession for perfection and, and improvement. And then it became my time. And I started you know, first with ski races. Then I started playing tennis. Then I, I raced with my, you no know, uh, as well. And that is where my memories it go because at school I was not that great. I didn't like school. I didn't want to study. I was just doing the bare minimum. My mind, my mom was a, a professor, high school professor at the time. Now she's a university professor. Uh, but I didn't like to study, but she forced me because the, the, the deal was you can play all the sports that you want as long as you now you keep moving forward at school. And so I remember I was going to school my school used to finish at 1.30 p.m. I would go home, have lunch, and then I would go play in tennis literally from 2 to 7, back home, and then I was having another training session after dinner. And so I couldn't study. But my mom was waking me up every day at 4 a.m. and said, now you have to study before going to school at 8. And so I still have that memory. I hated to wake up so early <laughs> and, and study. But that was the the deal I had I had with her. But Matteo, I'm curious the sports you just mentioned: uh, skiing, tennis, driving, racing, uh, car racing. Are there's something inherently individual about them, even though there can be teams? Yeah. Now you're in a position where you're on a team. You're leading a team. Yeah. Curious. Can you talk a little bit about you know the the 
difference, the relationship, you know, being an individual where it's all on your shoulders and now it's all on your shoulders and the shoulders of uh, all the other people on the A team. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah, all these sports, except when we were playing as a team, some competition in tennis and it was double, that is where I develop probably some leadership. Um, I, I still have some memories about that, but most of the other experiences were yeah, as an individual. I think I learned more about leading a team when I was at the law firm uh, because I had a really good, really great boss. Very, very demanding, uh, but I really admire him. And he's the guy who then moved and became the head of finance at the next law firm. And that is why I moved. Um, but yeah, there was a lot that I have to self-develop because usually it has always been just about myself and my own performance. Just from an outsider's perspective, hearing about your career, they might say um, those that's like a, a lot of interesting, but hard to draw a line through experiences. Mm -hmm. Like what is the through line? If you were to have to draw one between all the things that you've done, you, you well, mentioned law, yeah. sport, clean tech, and now health, you know, wellness performance. Yeah. I'll answer in, 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 in two dimensions, in two ways. So the first one is probably the common line has always been, Work really hard, keep raising your bar, keep improving, never give up. That, that is really who I am, right? If, if you know me closely. The interesting thing connected to that is um, sometimes I think if I was this little guy in this little town in the middle of nowhere in Italy today, how could I tell them to get where I am, I don't know. There is no rule, there, there is no way. And I have a niece, she's I think around 15, and it's so hard to explain how I made it here, which is it's still nowhere in the grand scheme of things, and it's still nowhere compared to where I wanna go. But for where I come from, it's still you know, a pretty decent achievement. And there is this, this thing that is fairly personal, so, my dad died uh, in 08, right? And I just became a lawyer. He died two weeks later. And at the time I was still working in the law firms. And so if you go back then, my dad could have thought, okay, look, Matteo is on a good trajectory. I was doing really well at the law firm. I, I, I think I was a pretty good performer there. Um, and so the, logic, the logical trajectory at the time was just for me to be, you no, know, maybe become a partner at a top law firm and and do finance, not to live between New York and Miami and lead, you no, know, such an amazing uh, group of people in tech, which was not, you no, know, my background. Keep in mind that I didn't speak English until when I was twenty three, so even if you go back, you no, know, even earlier of compared to when I became a lawyer, right? If you go back to when I was 21 years old, I was just this guy doing a lot of sport, having fun, doing decent at university. And then something clicks. And from there I jump and I start working at the top law firms in the world. And then there is another click and I move to America and I become an entrepreneur. And then I get in tech. And then I have also the opportunity to work obviously with this great team and also with investors like you guys and all the other people that backed us. It's sometimes I, it's something I discuss a lot with my wife, but it's almost impossible to explain how I made it. I mean, how I made these switches because they make no sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Matteo, someone would say you're crazy, you know, speaking no English <clears throat> on a nice trajectory at the law firm. And it's not like you're making a lateral move. Oh, I'll be in-house counsel somewhere. Yeah. This is kind of, you know, going from marshmallows to a steak or, you know, something crazy. The, any sense of how that click happened was that, you know, some trauma or some epiphany or anything that. Yeah. So I have one for, for both switches. So it was first year at college. I was doing decent. Then my mom brings back home a, a magazine 
that was being sold with the equivalent of the Italian Wall Street Journal. And in these magazines, there is this story about these big law firms. Until then, I didn't know anything about these law firms. And I was on a trajectory probably to work in my dad's law firm, which is really, really tiny, basic lawyer in a small town. And I read this thing because I didn't want to do my dad's job. And I read this thing and there are these guys working really hard, you know, doing all the biggest transaction in the world, taking company publics, doing big uh, M&A. And as I read the thing, I say, I want to do that. But there are two conditions to be at, not to, to be hired by these law firms. You need to speak English fluently and you need to graduate with honor. And so that day I say, okay, if these are the two things I need, I'm gonna get it done. And I started learning English and I graduated with honor. That was completely unexpected because I was, yeah, decent, right? So then I get into the, the two law firms. I'm there, I do all that. So I'm on a trajectory to you know, keep doing that. But then the crisis in 08 happens. And so I go from working like 100, 120 hours a week to very little because in finance, nothing is happening. And so I get bored. And when I'm bored, I start talking to a friend of mine who will become my co-founder about, okay, what, what, what do we do? I don't want to just sit here doing nothing. And we started a, a foundation, an association. And from there, we start learning about all these opportunities. And there was a bubble in Italy for renewable energy, where the government was paying a feed-in tariff. And so a lot of funds were finally coming to Italy to invest in Italy. And we saw the opportunity to bridge uh, the relationship between these funds and the, the owners of the land where all the solar plants would be developed. And so I was working at the law firm until 9 p.m. And then from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m., I started working on my side project. And the side project started making enough money that I could quit the law firm and become an entrepreneur. I mean, you know, how did you know any one of these things? You talked about your mom bringing home this magazine. And I, I love the focus that you, you, you created for yourself. I just need to learn English and I need to get honors. And then you get bored. And then you see this other thing happening in Italy. Like, how did you know any of these things were the right things to pursue? Did they? Yeah. So I analyzed that too. And the reality I didn't know. And I give you even a more uh, recent example, which is after COVID, when my wife and I, we start saying, look, now the company is remote. Uh, there is no reason to be in New York. Let's just move to Miami. And we literally decided, I don't know, probably within a week. Or another example is after I sold the first company in Italy, when you sell a company, you go to the notary and you sign all the papers. The following day, I moved to America to start the same company in the US. And my mom had to go in my apartment in Milan to just move things. I was renting this apartment, so I have to move things out. But I didn't even wait for that. I say, mom, can you take care of that? I'm moving to America. But if you ask me, the company was not funded. I think we raised like 200K at the time the, the, for the US company. So there was no money. I had to survive with the little money I made from the previous exit, which was fairly small. And I, I just moved to the other side of the world. Um, saying, okay, I'll figure it out, uh, but it sounds like a good opportunity. And so sometimes you sound naive and you could make big mistakes, but now I think I learned that I can trust my gut in some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. I just feel a spark inside me and I just go and then I know I can figure it out. You must also trust your capabilities too, because I heard you on another interview say, if I knew how hard this was going to be, I wouldn't have done it, but you made those choices to do it. Yeah. Well, like you have to, you must have known, like, I can do this. Yeah, I have a, a feeling that you can drop me in the desert in the middle of August with no water, come back two weeks later, and somehow I will survive. Then maybe I'm dead, but I truly believe that I will survive yeah. or I will get above and beyond what, what the average person does because probably that is one of my strengths i figure it out which is something that really comes from my parents particularly my mom you can drop my mom in in, in the desk my mom doesn't speak english if i bring her to new york 
she becomes a friend with everyone and I don't even know how they don't even speak the same language, but she will figure it out. And I don't know, she likes to cook and she wants the specific ingredients when she cooks. I don't even know how she finds these ingredients, particularly because she doesn't speak English, but she comes back with the ingredients, you know? <laughs> well, that's, it, it's interesting. You talk about the problem solving because we often think, you know, we're all parents and uh, th that's the greatest gift you can give your kid. Correct. Uh, because yeah. There will always be problems. We always tell founders, you know, your path is one that's strewn with boulders, unfinished bridges, floods. Your yeah. job is to figure it out. I just want to go back for a second. because From one perspective, someone could say, oh, God, Mateo is really impulsive. But on the other hand, you you can't be impulsive running eight I mean, you, because you have to be driven, focused. Um, you're leading a team. There are implications for all these decisions. And how do you mix the, the, uh, we'll call it the, what looks like impulsiveness, trusting your gut with the requirements of having to run a manufacturing business? Yeah. So I think the impulsive part, if, if you do a good job, you can leverage it, that to be very decisive which hopefully I am. Obviously, you pay a price sometimes to, if you take a decision really, really fast. But if the velocity is bigger than the tax that you pay because of the wrong decisions, like let's say 10% of the decision is wrong, so there is a 10% tax, is the velocity you gain bigger than the 10%? Uh, and I think so. Um, then sometimes I need to calm myself down. And the thing usually that helps you is to have a big picture and know where you're going. And so you want to be really fast and really agile in the daily decisions. So even when in the past, the company sometimes might have been in trouble or there were, you know, there was the SVB case, right? When some of our money was in SVB and you need to take those decisions under pressure very quickly. Those are moments that I enjoy uh, as a leader. Um, well, instead, the steady state is harder for me because I get bored. Uh, but in a company, particularly as the company grows, I, I always tell my team, look, shit is coming. Because there is there's always something broken and going wrong. And so I can focus on those and I try to fix them as fast as possible. We've seen your point about making changes quickly really resonates because we've seen entrepreneurs struggle with that where, you know, the risk is you end up kind of performing the definition of insanity for too long. You just kind of keep doing the same thing. Um, any advice to entrepreneurs out there about how to, like, how to know when there's a change that needs to be made and then actually make that change? Because you don't want to mess it up. Like whatever you've done has gotten you to that point. <clears throat> how do you know that you don't just keep doing the same thing for a bit longer versus you no, know, something fundamental has to change here? I would say in my experience, 80% of the times, maybe even 90, waiting makes no sense. You will always regret it. It's better to make the change now, learn immediately, and then keep adjusting. The thing you don't want to do is to make one change and then let things drop, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to keep this you know, agile man mindset. But if you see a problem, tackle it. If you need to make a change, do it. Uh, if something is happening in China, jump on a flight and just go today. I mean, it just happened to me in January. We were you not know, before launching pod four. Things were behind in China. I was in New York. I live in Miami. And they say, when can you be in China? And I say, tomorrow. And I flew to China with the clothes I had for New York. And that that that's just my attitude. And it's probably connected to a hidden anxiety where or dopamine where I really get dopamine when I get things done. And so for me, the sooner I get them done, the sooner I get the dopamine and, and I can move on mentally to the next thing. Um, and so that is probably what feeds me and gives me the energy, even if I'm tired. But Mateo, when we met you back in 2014, I think it was November, um, I confess, I didn't know all this about you. And it's inspiring to hear it all. And one point that I just wrote down, I wanted to just say, like, I'm sure your dad would just be so ama amazingly proud of you. Um, but 
we didn't know all this about you. We knew that you had this obsession with figuring out this sleep problem. Um, how might we, I guess I'm trying to think through the entrepreneurs that we meet now. It's like, how might we have learned that you could, you'd become the person that you are, or that you already were that person. And I guess I think about it in the context of you building your team. Like how, what are the qualities that you're looking for in team members? Are they the ones that you have or are they different as you, as you, you know, build, build this amazing team that's kind of running eight, what are the qualities that you're looking for and how do you learn them quickly? Yeah. So I actually work on this framework recently because I wanted to raise the bar again. So there are two things that really matter, two macro things, and then there are some other. The two macro are what I call um, evidence of greatness and motivation. Evidence of greatness is, you, I always take the last, uh, the final interview, right? If you go through the whole process, they, they sleep before being hired, you need to meet me. And I go through every single experience you had in personal or professional life. I mean, personal could be like sport, that, that kind of thing. And I want evidence of greatness because my assumption is you don't become, let's say you're 30, 30 years old, you don't become great for the first time in your life at day sleep. Somewhere you must have been great. Doesn't matter if it was about fixing the dishwasher, if it was being a tennis player or figuring something out, but I need to find some evidence that you have a spark. If you don't have that, that is a problem. And the second is once you have evidence of greatness, um, motivation, motivation to join Aid Sleep. And the reason is that maybe you are a good profile to join Accenture, but you might not be a, a good profile to join Aid Sleep. And so you need to be motivated to go through whatever it takes to join us. Like for example, there is a person who's gonna join us soon and she had certain plans, but she will have to lead a certain program that is really urgent. And what we told her is, look, your plans don't, 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 don't fit what we need at day sleep. So if you want to join us, you have to change the plans or this is not going to work. And she changed her plans. Um, so those are two things. Then usually the traits of very successful people are eight sleep are, um, we notice there is a, a growth curve. How fast you learn, which is also connected to how you take feedback. But usually the best people here are able to grow at the speed of the company. That is something people usually underestimate, right? If your company doubles every year, it means that you need to grow 2x every year, even as a CEO. If you go back to me as a CEO in 2014 and today, hopefully I, I, I have evidence that I'm much, much better, even compared to last January, right? So at the end of each year, I do a self-review of myself, plus I get it also from my executives. And if I look back, I feel embarrassed by who I was last January. Uh, based on the learnings of the year. That's great. I'm curious about something else, Matteo. You, when when you were when we met you ten years ago, and you had a company called Luna. Yeah, you remember that that one, um, which eight tur uh, which turned into eight. Did if we were looking through your eyes back then. What would we have seen in terms of a vision? You know, like the, the Soviets always used to say, oh, we have our five-year plan. This is what it'll look like at the end of five years. Never happened. But um, some people say, I envision a world of whatever. And other people say, hey, listen, when I started this, I had no idea where it was going to go. I just knew I wanted to do this thing. And it evolved and developed. What would we have seen looking through your eyes as you thought about eight? Yeah. So you have seen this vision to dominate sleep and become the everything sleep company to the power of data and technology. And I think this vision was formalized in a memo that I actually wrote in 2017. So a few days later, but the vision was the same. And is the, I wrote this memo and I wrote it on a Saturday and I sent it at the time to Keith Raboyce, who was a KV. And then KV led uh, our round uh, at the end of 2017 that gave us the money to build the, the, the pod. And the reason why I formalized that memo back then is uh, 
So I was meeting Keith that already passed on us a few years before. And I spoke to one of my friends who knew him well, and he says, look, Keith does a, will, will never invest in a company that does the obvious. He will want to hear from you something that he never heard. He's really passionate about sleep. And so I wrote this whole vision, which included the hyperpod. I don't know if you have read the, the piece of Paki or other pieces. Hyperpod is this canopy bed where everything is controlled. We control the temperature, the air quality, the oxygen, and we do the full body scanning of your body. And so this vision, I had it since from the early days. We just had to get there through steps. Today, I already sleep in a prototype of Hyperpod, and Hyperpod will come to market in a few years. But this concept of collecting data about you, optimizing the environment from you, and then based on the data, developing new products, that has always been part of my vision. I think this is a good time to shift off of just who you are as a person, your background, and, and talk about the business. And and just building off of this, what made you, I mean, there's, there's physicians and science and the whole medical field around sleep. What led you to think sleep was broken? And that technology was this thing that could solve it when, again, there was a whole industry built around sleep, sleep study, CPAP machines, whatever, you know, pick your thing. Like doctors train in this. What led you to think like you who knew nothing about sleep could start to solve it through technology? Yeah. So the sleep economy is around half a trillion. It's 400 billion, right? So it's pretty big. And the first thing you notice when you look at that is extremely fragmented. There are matter companies doing bed sheets, there are companies doing supplements, there are companies doing CPAP machines, but no one is connecting the dots for the customer. And as a customer, I don't want to think and learn about a new brand every time that I look for something in my sleep. That was problem number one. The second is that all these companies, there is no technology in sleep. So one of the things I always tell media uh, is, why Elon Musk is taking me to Mars and I still spend a third of my life on a piece of dumb foam, right? There is no technology in the third. I just pretend to go to bed. I'm really tired. I work all day to, and I just pretend to wake up eight, eight hours later and be perfectly refreshed. That, does, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why technology cannot be embedded in that part of my life? And that is when I started thinking about sleep enhancement through technology, but also body scanning because I thought, what can I do during those eight hours for our users that are standing still in the same place every single day? Um, and so that was always our contrarian view. And then you start thinking about the products and the type of data that you can collect while delivering a great user experience. Do, do you think sleep problems are a product of the modern world or is sleep kind of I mean, I was thinking before we got on here, like did cavemen have issues with sleep or did they sleep great? And it's only in this modern world that we started to have sleep issues and now technology can solve it. I think we always had that because even if you not read about the stoics and all that, the human psychology has always been the same. And so psychology has a huge impact on your sleep, stress, overthinking, your mind racing, all that part is part of humanity since when we were humans, you know, since probably Homo sapiens. That is one. The second is the environment is so important for you and the needs in terms of environment are different every single night. Did you have alcohol? So you need certain changes. Uh, did you work out late? Uh, if you're a woman, are you in menopause? Are, are you doing, you know, you're having your period or you're having pregnancy? And so the reason why technology can help you so much is because it can adjust and be personalized every night based on your needs. And so I think humans never achieved peak performance at sleep. We are getting there. But I also think sleep can be compressed because eight hours is just a random number that was selected because that is the average of what we need with an inefficient sleep. It is, and when I hear you say sleep can be compressed, I think uh, you're an athlete and I'm sure you've seen trainers who say, listen, you know, this guy spends four hours a day in the gym and three of those hours he's walking between machines, not doing much in one hour. I can give you everything and more that, you know, you've been doing in four hours is, are we wasting chunks of our night 
and eight comes along and says, no, no, we can get rid of all the fat, all the waste. What, can you help us understand how you move from, for example, eight to six and come out actually better? Sure. Uh, there are a couple of ways. First, uh, you can fall asleep faster, right? And, and so if today is going to take you 20 minutes, can we put you asleep in two minutes and you gain mm -hmm. uh, 18? Second, there are a lot of toss and turns, uh, which is another inefficiency. And so maybe you don't even notice them, but that becomes you know, micro, micro awake moments. Mm -hmm. And then in general, the whole light sleep can be compressed. The most valuable part of your sleep is deep and REM. But usually together, they are somewhere between 40 and 50% of the night. And so you're still spending, let's call it four hours of, light, uh, of time in light sleep. That is not really needed. At least it's not needed to be that much. And so if we could just cap part of the light <laughs> sleep while keeping deep and REM the same, that is how you gain time. And can you just, because you use this term, which I think is great, uh, sleep fitness. Yep. And when we think about fitness, just to go back to the gym, it's something, you know, we work on, we get better, we improve, but that's typically something that we're doing kind of consciously, purposefully, you know, I'm working here better for my head up, shoulders back, using my hips more on the swing. But when we're sleeping, we think of being unconscious. So can you help us understand a little bit about, you know, how do we build sleep fitness while we're not being sort of purposeful, aside from being purposeful enough to buy a pod? Yeah. So I'll start with an example and then I answer. When you go to bed every night, you're substantially is the equivalent of flying from New York to Rome every single day, right? You're flying to Europe every single day in, in terms of the length of the time. And so if you're flying to Europe tomorrow, I guess you're gonna prepare that flight. There are certain things that you need to put in order. You wanna make sure you have the right things with you, right? It's, it's a big deal, it's a long flight, right? We don't realize that we do that thing every single night. And to do that thing properly, you need to prepare. And so the reason why you sleep fitness is you need to find a consistency and you need to have a certain approach to your sleep. It's not that you just you know, work until one second before and you were eating junk food, drinking a couple of drinks, then you put yourself in bed and magically you wake up eight hours later feeling refreshed. There are certain things that we need to do. And the interesting thing is I don't have kids yet, but I have friends that start having a bunch of kids or babies. And if you look how methodical we are when we have babies about they need to do their bath at this temperature, and then we put their, their PJ, and then we play a little bit with them, and then they always go to sleep at the same time. The same thing, we just forget that when we become adults, we pretend to be these heroes that now I don't need all the things, but when you're born, the things are so important. And so finding that consistency in your habits, now, the lights, the temperature, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, making sure there is a certain period of time between your last meal and the time you go to bed, right? Putting yourself in the right mindset before going to bed. All these little tiny details, that is live fitness. You need to have the mindset of an athlete. You prepare for your journey. That is the equivalent of flying from New York to Rome. And you will wake up more refreshed. Hmm. You know, the, the fitness piece of this, I don't know, I, Obviously, we've been kind of learning about what you've built over 10 years, and I don't know how intentional it was, but part of the genius I see now in eight is that, because I've, you know, I sleep on an eight, I've worn a, a whoop, an aura, I wear an Apple watch, I've tried all these products. So many of them end up being kind of nice to have, you know, like after six months, I kind of figure out what it's doing for me. You're enabling people to to practice sleep fitness, but almost passively. Sure, there's thing, extra things that they could be doing, but people love pills, right? They want something that you just give them and it solves the problem. And that you've, you've developed this very clever thing that allows us to enhance our performance, but all we have to do is lie down. And oh, by the way, it's this thing that you have to have in your house. Like, I don't have to wear a watch. I don't have to wear a ring, um, but I need to lie down on something at the end of the night. And as you look back on it, was there, 
was there ever a possibility that eight wasn't going to be a hardware company? Like that it wasn't going to be this thing that you needed or that you'd have to buy and use versus coaching. You know, I could do all those things that you mentioned and maybe sleep better on my dumb foam mattress. Or was it always obvious to you that we needed to build things like material things? It was always obvious that we had to build material things that from a business perspective was the smartest thing I could do as a founder. Probably no. So <laughs> there, there are two different things, right? Building a consumer hardware business, uh, it's really hard, right? I All the hardware companies that started with us, they died. I, I, I don't remember any of them. And they had great founders. Uh, so it's a very, very hard thing. Then if you look at some of the most valuable companies in the world, Tesla and Apple, they are consumer hardware businesses. And so very few companies make it, but the ones that make it can really change the world. Even Dyson is another example, right? Great brand, uh, great products, uh, well-respected um, everywhere in the world. Uh, so I think if you want to deliver value while people are unconscious that you want to do the work for them, hardware is a requirement. Um, you just need to be able to go through that pain and as an hardware company, particularly in the early days to survive because of the, the, the cash flow requirements and, and the challenges. Do you, do you have more thoughts now about when a startup should be a hardware company versus not? Like, when does it make sense? What about the kind of problem requires hardware versus not? The way I, the simplified version is you need to be a painkiller and not a vitamin. If you are a vitamin as a hardware startup in consumer, it's very hard for you to survive. And so you need to get to a point where people need your product so badly that they are open to two things. One, pay a lot of money so that you can have decent unit economics. And second, that... Uh, you're solving such a big problem that even if your first product is crappy, it's still valuable enough for them. Because pod one is nothing comparable to pod four, mm -hmm. right? There were a lot of things, it was stiff, the comfort was not great, the, there were a bunch of things that we could have improved. But customers still love it so much, the word of mouth was still driving 30% of our revenue because it was a painkiller. And that gives you the time with the right unit economics to keep iterating. And now we are at pod four and then there will be a pod five, right? But if you're a vitamin and people are not open to pay the right price for your product and there is no virality word of mouth because yeah, you're okay, fine. But after six months, I don't need you anymore. You will struggle a lot. I, I've thought for some time that cooling, introducing cooling to the product was the real game changer, kind of the inflection point. I don't know. Do you agree with that? Like, was that a moment where, oh my gosh, we just yes. cracked this open? Yeah. I think before we were doing well, after the pod is when things really now took us to another trajectory. And why did it take so long to bring that to market, figure that out? It was really honestly money. Uh, we, we, so when we started selling or doing the customer discovery of the first product, which was a cover that was tracking your sleep, right? Everyone was saying, look, this is cool, but by the way, does it cool? Literally everyone. And so we understood very, very early that temperature, particularly cooling was the big deal for people and there was no solution. And there was plenty of clinical evidence that heating and cooling your body, so changing your body temperature at night is the game changer for sleep quality. Um, but we had product one that we already developed. We didn't have, and we had to ship it because we sold 8,000 units in pre-orders. And so we had to stay focused on that. Plus we didn't have the money to develop the new product. So it's not that we could spin off another engineering team. And so we shipped those units. We started growing with the first product. And then is when we convinced uh, Keith and KV, Cosla Ventures, uh, to give us the money to build the pod. So the pod was a completely new product and it went in from in four years from zero because it was a new product to hundreds of millions in revenue, which is pretty unique for, for an hardware product. Yeah. I love the idea of we sold 8,000, then we had to figure out 
how to actually build it. Yeah. And, and, and the, if you guys remember the story of China. So, so my wife is one of the co-founders, right, Alexander? And so it's after Y Combinator, we sold these 8,000 units in pre-orders, just did the, the seed round, whatever. But things are now happening in China. So we're struggling. No one of us had experience in outdoor. And so I go to her and I say, look, things are now happening in China. And she say, okay, cool. And so what? And I say, so I go to China. And she say, okay, fine. And for how long? And I say, until when I fix it. And so I go to China and I come back two, three months later. Uh, once things were fixed. And now our China team is still the team I hired. Yeah, that is how it works in my family. So yeah, go fix it. <laughs> it takes what it takes and then come back. Well, that's that's similar to, you know, you get dropped off in the desert and your choice is, well, now I got to yeah. figure out how to get some water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. try and I'll get it done. The, the cooling part is the part that, you know, when I talk to people about eight, that's the part that always feels to them magic. Yes. Uh, and, and there's something sort of interesting because you have technology mixed with magic. You know, I, I just want to shift gears for a second here. You know, th th most people who have done startups, you know, know the word pivot. And, you know, <clears throat> you've done a number of pivots, even though you've had this vision, you know, which stays on the horizon and you're, del you know, you're getting closer and closer to deliver delivering on. But can you talk a little bit about the pivot from, you know, we were going to, you know, we were making mattresses with covers. We then decide uh, we're going to be, and maybe started off B2B, we're going to do these deals with Sealy, et cetera. And then we go, mm, and B2B is very alluring for investors, particularly if there's sort of a SaaS component to it. Uh, and then we decide, no, we're going to go B2C. And then we decide we're really going to, we'll still sell you a mattress if you really want it. But yeah, I think, I don't know what the current uh, ratio between mattress and covers are, but I think it's like 1% to 99 or something like that. Yeah. So there's yeah. multiple pivots in the eight story. And every one of those pivots has risk. Can yeah. you talk about, you know, that, that journey? Yeah. So... The funny thing is most of the pivots of these ideas, then they worked. And then you could say, oh, these guys were geniuses. But now I'll tell you what happened in each of them. And we were not geniuses. <laughs> yeah, maybe we were fairly smart in how to manage that. But a lot, there were a lot of things involved. So the first one is you, you spoke about B2B, right? And so we were pushed very hard from investors in the early days to go B2B. Because the concept was kind of Intel inside, build this technology and all of them, they will take it. And so we were very, very close to sign a super large agreement with one of the largest mattress manufacturers. And actually, we got the term sheet to lead our CDSA based on that. The point is, like two days before signing the term sheet, this company, after working with them for almost a year to try to finalize this agreement, they called me and they say they're out. And so I tell them, what, what do you mean you're out? I try to convince them. I say, look, let me fly there. I'm going to meet you now. Don't, don't fly here. We are out. This is not going to happen. And so we lost the CDSA. And that was fair from the investors, meaning they, they always told me, look, we're going to invest and lead your CDSA because we assume that this deal is going to happen. And so I had to call them and say, the deal is not going to happen. And they walk away in a fair way. At that point, I think we were like, literally probably we had four weeks of money in the bank, something like that. I still remember very clearly talking to my co-founders. I still remember where I was. We were on the street. My co-founder, he smokes. He was smoking in front of the door of the building where the company was. Uh, I, I have a very vivid uh, uh, image. Um, and so as founders, we always wanted to do consumer. We were way more passionate about that. And so at that point, we were left substantially with that option. And so we had to make it work. So that is when B2B really goes away. <laughs> it was not our decision. Um, then the decision to switch to the cover only happened like this. So first, we kept seeing customer 
saying, look, I don't want to buy another mattress. I don't want to convince my partner that this mattress is comfortable. And so we started seeing a lot of friction. And so I go to the marketing team. We were selling only the mattress with the pod, right? With the heating and cool. And, and I said, there is too much friction. What if we launch a cover only? But obviously in hardware, making a change like that takes, I don't know, somewhere between six and 12 months. And so one night I started thinking, look, we don't have six to nine months. We need to make this change like tomorrow. And so what we do is we, within 48 hours, we launch the cover. And I tell you how. We were producing the mattress. The mattress was being wrapped into a, 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 a fabric uh, encasement and the cover was taped to the encasement. And so what I said is we use the same thing, so the cover and this encasement, and we call it cover only. And we see if people buy it. And we launched the thing in 48 hours in the accessory page. So it was hidden. 20% of the sales overnight become the cover, even if the thing is, is hidden. Hmm. And imagine that people had to wrap the whole mattress to put this encasement and then the cover on top. And so we were very concerned they would complain. No one ever complained. No customer. And it means you have to raise the whole mattress to wrap it. And that is how the cover started. So then we move it to the main page and now the cover is 97% of the revenue. Hmm. Wow. Mateo, what, what, what else have you learned along this journey just about consumers? Like if you, if we fast forward, I don't know, 10 years, you're launching another company, consumer focused. What have you learned about consumers that wasn't obvious to you at the outset? and what that you'd apply in another venture? Well, two things are the two big ones. Customers want you to do the job for them. So one of the things when I always push the team is we need to simplify, customers are busy, they're spending their time and things and other things. So whatever we do, we do it for them or you need to be as simple as possible. Don't make things complicated. They want basic things, very simple. They have very basic needs, right? So. It's not that they remember all these things. They remember cooling. For some people, majority is cooling. For a few others, is metrics, right? But they're basic in, in a positive sense. And the last one is don't overthink about users until when you try, you don't know. Like you think of the cover. Sometimes we change name to products and the split between the products completely changes, right? So they're very basic. And there are things that you can imagine and they might just work or not. Just launch them and see. Sometimes people, particularly in consumer, they start thinking, oh, we are this big brand and all that. And even if Aid Sleep is doing fairly well, in the grand scheme of things, Aid Sleep is still a very tiny brand. So we care about the brand, but at the end of the day, just make the change and let's see if it works. Mm -hmm. the, I, I was thinking about culture and culture always flows from the top, no matter what. Yeah. And if there was going to be, and bear with me on this analogy, if there was going to be stuff flowing off of Mateo, the leader, down to the people, what are the elements you want to flow off of you and infuse into the people around you at the team? Aggressive execution at, at an insanely high speed. We are hardcore. We work really hard, no excuses, no bullshit. Just get it done and think in terms of hours. I have this rule where if I don't set the deadline, that thing happens the same day or within 48 hours. And I never like to think in days with the team. I literally say, you think in hours and split it in 48 hours increments. You know what, Mateo? I'm, I'm I'm seeing that ski racer, aggressive execution yes. at high speed. Yeah. I love that. So I'm actually I I, I was watching this show called uh, The Bear. You know about oh, the rest. Yeah. Know. And okay. they have this sign called "Every Second Counts." I'm installing it right there, and now it will be really big in the bullpen here in New York and also in San Francisco. Every second counts. It's all about velocity. Go, 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 go. But we, we smile when we hear that because we tell all of our founders when we talk with them, uh, 
we say, I want you to write these words on the wall. Time is my enemy. Yeah. True. Mateo, You're right against time. If every second counts um, and you run a sleep company, I'm guessing when you sleep, you recharge. Are there any other outlets for you where you can put every second counts to the side and allow yourself to not feel that immense pressure and urge to you know make the most of every you know moment that you have do you ever like yeah. so i'm i'm really obsessed with time efficiency like i ab test time off when i take it with with my wife to see how much i can recharge how fast how i feel and then we debate uh, on everything we do um the the other thing and, and then i'll answer the question the other challenge with the consumer business is literally every day I wake up and I look at the revenue of the previous day. And that, so every day it's, it's literally your, your ski race, right? You're fighting. I monitor how every day is, is doing. I remember a long time ago when we were making eight to 10 orders and I was still receiving the notification of each order. And sometimes it was 9.30 p.m., and I was looking at my phone, hoping that then one more order would come in because it would be 10% more revenue right, <laughs> for the day. Um, and, and so consumer businesses live like that. So it, it puts a lot of pressure. But at the same time, I think of me as an athlete. And I think I need to take care of myself uh, in terms of physical shape um, to perform at my best. And so I work 24-7 because sleep is still my work. Um, but I optimize everything, right? From my diet, I'm on a keto diet, cold plunge, sauna. I mean, everything in my life is hyper-optimized to really get the most out of my time. By the way, that's a great, a great line when you, you turn and you say, I'm going to work and you crawl into bed. Exactly, like, right? Sleep is my work. But, yeah. but Mateo, is there ever a time where you're not optimizing for every, where you just can say... I don't have to measure this. I don't have to A-B test this. I can just be, or maybe not. It just feels like it's a lot. It's a lot. And the answer is no, but I don't say, I don't say that with, with, with pride. It's probably a bug I have. I call it the scene with my wife. I have a scene. And this scene is all the things that they become a strength in a certain environment, but it's never enough. I can't give up, I, I can quit, my, my, my brain keeps going, right? And so dealing with that sometimes is hard because maybe you have a bad day, maybe there are certain things happening in your life that, that are not going, right? And so then you start almost judging your whole life like, oh, I'm so invested in this thing and this is not all that I'm doing. And, and it's so hard to detach mm -hmm. from that. It's painful. But I think if you want to be number one in the world at tennis, it's painful. And then it, it just needs to be your decision. Is that bigger than anything else or not? Mm. There's no right choice. And the choice can change over time. But it's hard. Really hard. Sometimes. And, and then add to that, I guess, the fact that your wife, who's an amazing person, is also your business partner. So it's not necessarily like you get to go home and just yeah. compress i'm sure dinner is just talking about eight like what can yeah. you tell us a bit about what it's like working with your wife yeah so be before working with her i always had a, a rule with my previous co-founders that i would never work with my partner but with alexandra before eight sleep we were already doing hackathons on saturday and sunday the two of us building stuff and so that is how it came up right it was very natural but she's different from me because i'm a 24 7 guy I can keep thinking about a problem nonstop until when I fix it. Um, while instead in her case, she needs to zoom out and be, and be a bit distracted. And that is how she finds the ideas. And so we have a deal. And the deal is that up to a certain time in the evening, I can keep talking about work, but at a certain point I need to stop. But I can still slack her. And so sometimes we are on the couch watching TV at 9.30 before going to bed. I cannot talk about work because she wants to be treated like I would treat any other executive, right? But I can still slack her. And so I can hear the phone is vibrating and it's me writing. 
Uh, but I cannot talk about that. And she gives me the Saturday mornings when I when I, we do another one on one. She reports to me, and we do one one on one during the week. And then there is a more open one on one on Saturday morning where I say, "Look, I have all these problems. Do you have any thought?" Um, but Saturday afternoon, I cannot bother about work. I can still slack, and I can still share documents, but I cannot talk. <laughs> Unless it's very urgent at that point. That. I think and then uh, Sunday afternoon we work again. But that individually, I go in my office, she goes in her office. I know Andy's wife well, and it sounds like we all are very lucky to have these saints in our lives. Because I feel the same way about my wife. Because sometimes yeah. she says my blind spot is that I just don't turn off. Like, uh, I don't see that because I'm to your point, every second counts. Um I, I had one question I was curious about, about the product and kind of the vision. If if I'm buying an eight today, I think kind of bottom price is what, about $2,000? Is that right? 2500 yeah. 2500 From one perspective, if it's going to help me sleep better, live better, the cost seems like a no-brainer. And yet I'm guessing a lot of consumers look at that and see sticker shock. How do you make this a product for the masses that could all benefit from this? I think uh, if you use Tesla as a as a um, as a framework, we are at the Model S. Uh, so right now you're buying our Model S. I think over time there will be the Model Three. Will also go up, so there will also be the Roadster. And so I really think in portfolio strategy um, where we cover different needs at different price points. Um, and we offer everything you need to improve your sleep performance. I'll, I'll look forward to the plaid and the ludicrous mode on your uh, on me eight. too. I like that. You know, and, and one other thought I was thinking about unwinding, maybe just some powder, ski some powder in the back bowls, where everything is serene and quiet. Yeah, you know. Um, as we draw to the end of this, I, I, I'm curious. You're obviously a, a very successful guy in a number of different fields. But most people we talk to, there's always something they, if they could wave a wand, they would add something to their personality or their their fundamental being or remove something. You know, particularly people who are driven to always get better. If you could wave a wand, and and this is not about I wish I knew French or you know I could juggle, but something fundamental about Matteo, what would you add or remove? Well, I mean there are certain things that I know are not my strength, like I'm not patient, <laughs> to give you an idea, but. I don't think I would remove it because that is a second order effect or actually a, a first, a, you know, a first principle part of then a lot of other things that I have. So I, I think is there are two sides of the coin in who I am and there is one that is you now more productive and efficient and is the, the one that drove me to certain results. There is the other side that is a bit more the, the darker side with the scene this inability to be patient, to you know, keep thinking about work. Then if I remove that, then the other one would will leave. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think I would change anything um, in myself. And not because I'm good. I have plenty of things that I need to improve. But I also love, I'm, I'm obsessed with self-improvement. And so knowing that I have certain deficiencies actually gives me dopamine because you know what, now I'm going to fix them and I'll get better at that. I like that. I like the flip. We sometimes say the flip side of a virtue is a vice. Yeah. Is yeah. there a deficiency right now in particular that you're working on? Um. Yes. I think as a leader, you want to keep this concept of everything, every second counts, we need to go, we need to get things done. But at the same time, I also need to be able to inspire and give you some joy. Like, okay, here is an example. One of the things people always say about me as a, as a weakness is I don't celebrate enough. If we achieve a big goal, I'm already immediately thinking about the next goal. Mm. 
-hmm. But for other people around you, sometimes this is heavy because they fought for six months to make that thing happen. We achieve what we have to achieve. Maybe we even outperform. And fuck, Matteo, now is already thinking about the next goal. Give me a break for one day. <laughs> so probably that is one thing I would change because I don't think it would have a negative impact on achieving now our ambitious goals. But I think it would honor more our people after a long period of work. Well, Matteo, I'm sure it never feels like it's enough, but I'm hoping at some point in the week, the month, the year, you get to pause and just look at what you've done because it is pretty tremendous. Um, and just changing a, the world. Yeah, changing the world. Thank you. As a parting question, we like to ask at the end, other than family and maybe other than your wife, is there anybody in particular that you'd like to thank? Um. I think I have always been lucky since when I was a kid, like my best friend, uh, now he's very successful in Singapore, but he came again from a very small town in the middle of nowhere in Italy. And I think a lot of drive uh, that I have also came from, from having him as a close friend um, in the early days. That really inspired me to then develop this ability to keep raising my bar. And so there have been a bunch of people around me during the during this year even my boss when i was at the law firm right this, this guy was incredibly good and so i still look at him uh when when i think of a great leader awesome that's great uh, and even though will said that's the last question i do have one more if i can slip it in there we go what would you want your epitaph to be i think about that a lot I use this regret minimization framework where you know, I fast forward, I'm 100 years old, I, I look back. I would like to build a, a global iconic company that help millions of people to improve their life. It's not about money, it's not about success, it's not about IPO. Uh, but if by then that is what my kids and my grandkids will remember, I think it was a, a life worth living. And on that note, that's hard to beat that one. Uh, and, and you're already, listen, you're already part way down that road because uh, I'm sure you've spoken to many eight users who sing your praises. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Matteo. This was great. Good to see great you. Great seeing you. Thanks. Have a good Have one. Me.